about open education resources with Christina Ishmael. And, um, you know, like you're going to really enjoy this conversation. You're going to get a lot of, out of it because Christina is incredibly smart and also very nice and a great speaker. So, um, so you're going to really enjoy that. Uh, all right, let me talk a little bit about uh, EdChat Interactive and, and talk about the platform before we get started. Our whole purpose in uh, creating EdChat Interactive is to allow people who are doing really interesting things in education to share them with other people in education in a way that's more like the way adults learn than a typical webinar. We've all seen webinars in the past. Somebody like me is sitting up there as a, as a talking head. We've got slides. But in EdChat Interactive, we wanted to change that experience. And in order to do that, we're using a platform called Shindig. And I'd like to explain some of the features of Shindig so that you know how, to, how you're going to be interacting tonight. So starting off, if you look at your screens, you're going to see that there's an, you have an avatar. And underneath your avatar is a menu of icons. Um, towards the left is an icon for text chat. And that allows you to talk to the participants um, or text the participants, other participants here and also uh, to text Christina. So what what I'd like you to do is to click on that ab that icon right now, the text chat icon. That's going to open a dialog box, which is going to look like this. And you'll see at the bottom is where you can type something in. Why don't you introduce yourself? Where are you from? And what's something that you'd like to learn tonight? Um, and so Christina will, will, will see that. The other people will see that. And by the way, if you see what some, if you see something that somebody types in and you have something to add to their point, feel free to type it in because, again, interaction is what is, is, and conversation is what helps adults learn most. Uh, I will say that the one person who can't see anything that you're typing in is me. But I do have some spies out there. So if you say something mean about me, they're going to tell me. Maybe. So, so the first thing, again, is uh, the first, first icon is text chat. The second icon is to ask a question. Now, if you, click, if you were to click on ask question, you're going to get a dialog box to allow you to ask a question. That question then goes to me. I can pass the question on to Christina. If it's a technical question, I can answer. does look different from a normal system from from a system on a computer um, I don't have screen captures of that but you can still um, do text chat and you can still ask a question uh, I'm not sure that that you can do this next thing but um, yes the the iPad it does allow you to do some type of uh, participation but not as much as if you were on the the web version Okay, so we've covered text chat. We've covered ask a question. The third avatar that's important for you is to raise hand. Now, there's going to be times where you might want to um, come up on stage and say something. If you raise your hand, then I know that you want to come up on stage. There's going to be times where Christina will say, you know, um, if anybody has some great OER resources that you want to share, or if somebody has a case where they want to know about OER resources, raise your hand and let's talk about it. In which case, you'll click on the raise hand button. I'll bring you up on stage, and you and Christina can have a conversation about whatever subject matter you're you're interested in talking about. So those are the three key avatars. I will say that the um, the one of the most interesting things about the Shindig platform is it allows you to have private conversations with other people who are here. So if you have a microphone, uh, you can actually click on the avatar of another person and have a private conversation. The way we're going to use that to 
tonight is there's going to be times where Christina is going to say, um, you know, some general question, you know, like, for example, she might say, let's, let, let's break into small groups. And why don't you talk to another person about how you might use OER resources in science or, or something like that, or what's been your experiences with OER resources, in which case, you're going to click on the avatar of another person and the two of you are going to be doing a private video chat. Only only the two of you or the three of you who are involved can hear each other. Um, after a couple minutes, we'll bring everybody back up and um, and and we'll resume uh, the, uh, the, the shindig event. So those are the different ways for, that uh, we're going to build interaction into tonight's session. The first time this uh, the small group happens, I'll, also, I'll come up on stage and I'll go through it again. Uh, I do want to say that uh, next week we're having a really interesting session on game-based learning. Uh, Matt Farber wrote a book about educators who are using games in their classes and there's a group of us who support each other in the use of game-based learning. We call ourselves the tribe um, and Matt's book really talks about the, the, the tribe. Uh, a number of the tribe members are going to be here and this will give you a chance if you're interested in game-based learning to talk to educators who are using it every day in their classrooms. So uh, just, you know, you, you know, the you all got here. So uh, to go to www.edchatinteractive.org and you can register for that event and like all of our events, it's free, um, so it should be good. And um, now uh, I'd like to bring up Christina. Uh, you, you've probably seen her uh, biography before, but uh, let me just find her so I can start bringing her up. Um, but uh, she was one of the people who really spurred, or maybe the person who spurred, the Go Open movement in the, um, oops, sorry, I just clicked on the wrong thing. Um, so she uh, was uh, basically spurred the o Go Open unit for, unit for the um, U.S. Department of Education, and I think she started as a teacher of high risk students in Omaha, Nebraska. Isn't that is that right? That is correct. So that yeah, so that's you know I'm, I'm impressed by both, um, <laughs> and uh, maybe just and and maybe describe you know where you are now at New America. And what you're doing there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in DC speak, I work at a think tank. Um, outside of DC, I get to say I work at a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> so I work on two teams. I work on the education policy and public interest technology teams. Wow. And uh, geographically, where are you? Are you Currently, in Washington? as of this moment, I'm in DC. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'm on the road a lot. I was just in Europe and then California and then back in DC for a few for a few days. It's nice. <laughs> okay. You know, and I just I want to give a shout out because a friend of mine, uh, Paul Shercliffe, is here, and um, he um, he's going to be here as long as he can, uh, but. Uh, he's actually going to be writing a test, so he may not be able to stay for the whole time. So, um, Paul, I just want to thank you for for coming, and um, Christina, maybe I'll I'll just come down and you just tell me when to advance okay. the slides. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you on a Wednesday evening. Again, coming to you from DC. Um, I am going to share my slides with you after um, this. Uh, this presentation, but just so you know, uh, those will be shared with you with the Creative Commons license. And um, if you have more information or questions about that, then I'm happy to answer those. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So um, Mitch, if you want to get us started in the next slide, and I'm going to start with the question that's come up a lot um, in my work over the past two years, and the question of why. What is my why in all of this work? And I kind of gave away my story, the part of my story, but no, it's good. I want to tell you a little bit about my journey as far as how I got here from a classroom teacher to the position that I'm currently in. So my why starts with <laughs> classroom teacher. Um, so if we want to advance to the next slide, um, the classroom teacher, I started in Omaha, Nebraska over 10 years ago as a kindergarten teacher in South Omaha, which is a largely Latino um, population, has a large Latino population. And out of my 20 students, there were, thir or excuse me, 17 of them that came to me speaking no English. And so the district issued curriculum, which you may be familiar with in this next photo, um, is just what we got. Um, the photo is of the textbooks. 
and there we go. Okay, so the textbooks. Um, now I will I will preface that I took these uh, this picture at a high school this past weekend. So no, we were not doing calculus in kindergarten. However, you all get the idea whenever I say that it started with the district issued curriculum, and I spent many. Uh, weekends and, and evenings trying to supplement the resources that were in my classroom because it was never enough for my English language learners, um, particularly during their language acquisition phase, which we were at the very beginning of in kindergarten. And so I spent a lot of time doing that, much like I'm sure a lot of you have in your, um, in your classrooms or at the district level. Next. I want you to see some of the faces of my students. So these are some of my students whenever I moved um, to my second school district and I was an ELL specific teacher. Um, so I worked with over 85 kids on my caseload and from first through sixth grade, the majority of my students were doing pretty good and I did more like the monitor status, um, but I did a lot of small groups as well as pushing in and co-teaching with um, the regular classroom teachers. And then I had some newcomers. Um, so in my first position as a classroom teacher, I relied a lot on my Spanish speaking abilities to be able to translate materials and, and make sure that students were able to access the instructional materials. When I moved into the second role as, a, as an ELL teacher, I had newcomers that came to me from Togo, West Africa, and spoke a variety of tribal languages as well as French. And then I had to figure out what I was going to do to be able to translate the resources. Um, so I relied a lot, again, on things that were currently, or that existed online that I could use to supplement kind of the curriculum that we had in our classrooms, as well as kind of leaning in on the strategies to teach ELLs. And then four and a half years ago, I moved to the state. I moved to the Nebraska Department of Education as the digital learning specialist. And this was a brand new position. And I really got to create it as I went along. And part of that was um, internal, where I got to kind of lead my, uh, my colleagues in how they could integrate technology in the teaching and learning, the assessment, the title programs. But then the other half was leading professional learning across the entire state of Nebraska um, for all 245 public schools. Nebraska is actually one of seven states that does not allow charter schools. And so we have a very strong um, public school system, and I worked with them as well as private, independent, and parochial schools, um, and kind of our service agencies in between, and became the school library liaison, which led me to the project that I get to kind of talk about here, which was the Nebraska Books Project. And we know that in fourth grade and eighth grade, um, we have our, our state history kind of focus in social sciences. And the copyright date of the Nebraska textbook that we had was from the early 2000s, and it was the same book that was used in fourth grade as in eighth grade. I'm sure you can hear that there was, there was some eye rolls there and there was a, a lack of engagement by students, particularly in eighth grade. So we had this idea to leverage um, the, the app iBooks Author in our process of trying to encourage students and teachers to curate their own books and create their own books where it would tell local history. So they could work with local historical societies. They could work with some of our national monuments that are within the state of Nebraska, like Scott's Bluff National Monument, um, Chimney Rock, things like that, that they could start to tell the stories at, in a more localized context. And so that is um, what I got to do as the school library liaison, as well as digital learning specialist. And somehow along the way, I also became well-known and well-versed in copyright, fair use, and creative commons. <laughs> <laughs> which um, is fun for me and I geek out on that, but not everyone gets as excited as I do about that. Um, but we were able to work with teachers and students and have these conversations around copyright, fair use, and creative commons when they were creating these books. And then we got to have student authors and teacher authors. So the next photo, I believe, or the next slide is a photo of some of these uh, student authors. So these are some sixth graders that uh, wrote their own books all about Nebraska history, anything from Pioneers to um, Chimney Rock, that was actually one of them. And then you'll see um, in the bottom right corner, there's a gentleman overlooking a young boy as he's talking to one of the state board members, but that is actually the commissioner of education for the state of Nebraska. And they got to present their work to not only the commissioner, the lieutenant governor, as well as the state board of education, and this was just the first group that did this. And so the top right group is another group from Lexington, Kentucky, or excuse me, Lexington, Nebraska. And uh, they also wrote a couple of books and they chose to do their focus on science because that is what the teacher um, led uh, as far as what he taught. And then he wanted to encourage them to be student authors. So this was a really cool project that I was involved with and kind of helped spearhead and kind of 
like was my entry point into um, the world of OER and learning about this. And then that led me to the US Department of Education, um, where I was the K-12 Open Education Fellow for a full year. So I bridged administrations. I came in in April 2016 through April 2017 and um, kind of picked up the, the ball from my predecessor, Andrew Marcinic, and who helped launch this at the White House in October 2015. And I got to kind of grow this. And so when I acquired the project, it was um, there were 40 state or excuse me, 40 districts that had committed to this work as well as 14 state departments of education that had committed to go open. And that was really like uh, for the district level, that was a commitment to replace one textbook in one grade level um, and one content area, for example, sixth grade science. So it wasn't a full K-12 scale right away. And so when I acquired it, there were 40 districts, 14 departments of education. And when I left in April of 2017, we had grown that to 109 districts as well as 20 states that were involved. And now, let's see if we go to the next um, next slide. We can see some of the work that we had um, in December 2016. Um, so a few months before I left and before the change of administration, we got to celebrate that we had hit the 100 district mark, uh, which was quite a celebration in the office. And of course, um, all of these people uh, were phenomenal district district leaders that I had the chance to work with over my time um, there that uh, you can also see some state leaders in there as well. And we had the chance to do uh, different regional summits all across the country. And these regional summits continue today. And in fact, the Office of Ed Tech um, tries to keep tabs of these regional summits that are happening. So you can find out more information on the Office of Ed Tech's website. So then that leads me to the work that I'm doing now, which is public interest technology and education policy. So my work was really um, kind of brought together and I am um, funded and, and sponsored by the Hewlett Foundation who really believe in me and the work that I'm doing so that I could continue to kind of incubate a project or this project in particular and figure out where we're going next. And so that leads me to the project or the website that I launched last month, which is the Pre-K-12 OER in Practice. Um, without the constraints of working for the and I was able to kind of capture historical information around this work and this implementation at the pre-K-12 level, as well as um, where are the resources to get started. So prior to being at New America, I wasn't actually able to tell people where to go find these resources. I could recruit people to be a part of this network and this, this community, but I couldn't necessarily tell you where to go find these resources. So I spent, uh, I would say about the first six months of, of my fellowship digging into some of these resources, much like you all do, and trying to curate them and put them into some sort of logical list where it, it uh, notes if they're free or they're openly licensed. Um, they may be a combination of the things and what you will find on each of those, of those resources, as well as resources for professional learning. This is a huge thing. So whether you're a teacher and you wanna take this back into your school district and say, you know, where would we get started in this? Or even district leaders are saying, where would we even get started in this? There are some resources to get started. Um, and, and kind of dig into that as far as learning more about what OER even is. And then we're also mapping the districts. And this is the next piece. So we had the 114, which is now where Go Open sits. And those are the districts that committed to the replacing the one grade level and, or excuse me, one textbook in one grade level and one content area. And we wanted to be able to kind of recognize that not everyone can make that commitment for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe it's political, maybe it's that we don't want to do a full replacement, but we want to supplement the resources that we have. And so we've tried to capture as many districts we know that are using OER in some way, shape or form and put them on this interactive map so that when I actually hover over the pin drop, I can see the district, where it's located, the grade level and the content area that they're focusing on. And then if the district is not actually already represented on this map, if you scroll down to the bottom of this website, there is a Google form where you can actually contribute your um, district information and we can add you to the map. So I've added about 15 different districts um, since we first got started with this. So we're up to about 130 districts that are identified on this map and we would love to get more, of course. <laughs> So that's my why, and I want to pause because this is supposed to be the interactive, and that's what I love about this. So I would love to hear what's your why, and I would love to break into our small groups now at this point and um, talk to your new neighbor or your new head, I should say, that's going to be in your group, mm -hmm. and um, let's talk about our why. Why are we even? Why are we even interested in this? 
All right. So this is the time where if you have a microphone uh, for you to click on the avatar of another person and uh, talk about, you know, your experiences, right? Your experiences with OER, um, uh, you know, and why you're interested in them. I'm going to bring Christine down so uh, you can actually get into a conversation with her as well. Um, so, uh, Christine, bye. <laughs> um, and then I'll stop myself also. Uh, so please click on the avatar of another person. Uh, it's fun. Uh, most of the people here don't bite. And if you don't have a microphone, uh, open up that uh, text box, you know, that, that text uh, icon underneath your avatar, and you can type in some of the reasons and respond to each other in text. I'm going to bring myself down and uh, we'll come back up in a couple minutes. Okay. Uh, it looks like a few of you had a chance to talk. You know, so I just want to say, uh, Christina, when um, I did a, uh, I, get, I got to interview district people about two years ago about, you know, what textbooks they were using or what materials they were using. And, um, and one of the things that came out is, well, first of all, you know, Michigan and Utah seem to be on the forefront of the OER with, mm. um, you know, uh, using OER, although I saw from your map that there seemed to be a tremendous number of districts around Pittsburgh. Um, and, yeah. and New York wasn't, <laughs> wasn't that far behind. And the people who were using OER were using it because they were changing instructional practices. They were changing from mm. students reading a textbook and answering questions and writing essays to ch students more doing things, both in, in ELA, in social studies, um, and science, yeah. which is where we, where we were asking and and the textbook became so much less important then so providing the resources for students that when they needed them they could go find the, the resources but the students were learning a lot by doing it. is that are you seeing a change in pedagogy as, as students as you know for the schools that are migrating to OER are you, are you seeing that also 
So we're starting to see that. And I think the reason why we're just now starting to see that is that um, Go Open specifically focused on replacing a textbook with OER. And so a lot of folks approach that as a pure substitution. And if you're familiar with the SAMR model in, in ed tech world, it was substitution. And so now we're working to get to the R. We're working to get to the redefinition, which is mm -hmm. where the actual instructional models start to change as well as the pedagogy. But I think it's also in conversations that I have now with district leaders, it's not where I simply say, okay, what grade level and content area you're going to focus on to replace that textbook, but it's more about what do you want teaching and learning to look like in your district? And then how are those resources going to actually help you with that? Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is that Andrew Marcinek was completely wrong, right? I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> no, kidding. I'm not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, he's gonna kill me! <laughs> I deny. I deny. No, you did, you did not say that at all. I just I just want. <laughs> okay, so, so with that, I'll bring myself okay. down, and <laughs> I'll bring myself down and let you go on with your slides. That sounds good. All right, so now that we've, we've kind of established the why, at least my why in particular, and some folks got to share theirs in the text uh, or in the chat, then I would like to talk a little bit about the what. And so let's start um, with some basics. Uh, what are all of these different resources that we're even talking about? So the first resource that I want to talk about are proprietary resources. So basically anything that we pay for, whether it is digital or print, um, whether it is a physical textbook or if it is a digital textbook, if it's a subscription or a database, these are all the things that would be defined as proprietary resources. Then we have free resources. And the free resources are the kind of instructional materials that you find online um, or even in print, but they are available to you for free. And there's still technically a copyright attached to that. And that's on the next slide as far as what our definition is for free resources. Um, so anything that you would find, now I come from elementary world, and so we would subscribe to the Mailbox magazine which I believe is still happening um, in a lot of elementary schools. And it would sit in the teacher's lounge and you could thumb through it while you're eating your lunch and look at different activities for various holidays or just different monthly things you could do. Um, those are all free resources. Uh, and then of course we have all the things you can find online, whether it's through Pinterest um, or different resources or repositories that have their, um, their resources available to you for free. Then we get into openly licensed or open educational resources. And those are defined as, and this is from the Hewlett Foundation that we've kind of sent that the Office of Ed Tech synthesized and then included in the National Ed Tech. And those are the teaching, learning, and research resources that are in the public domain or have a license affixed to them that allow the, the key part of that is their free use, reuse, modification, and sharing with others. So it's really important to note. Um, that aspect of things. So what do these three things look like next to one another? This next slide has a table where we can actually kind of identify what these things look like. So open, as I mentioned, um, free or minimal cost because sometimes we print and that does require some sort of cost. It has an open license that's affixed to it. It's very flexible as far as what you can do with the actual resource. And then an example would be something that you might find on OER Commons. Free resource, again, free resource, Copyright is still technically attached to a free resource, so your flexibility is a little bit more limited that you would still have to get permission from the creator in order to customize it and kind of change it. An example of that would be something from the Smithsonian Learning Lab. They're developing some incredible resources, lesson plans, activities built around primary sources and artifacts that they have that they've that they've digitized in the Smithsonian, um, but those are all free and not necessarily openly licensed. And then of course we have the proprietary resources. Ranges in costs, which I know that Mitch tweeted out earlier one of my slides, and I'll get into an example of what some of the very varying costs look like these days. Um, but copyright restricted, very restrictive as far as what you can do with those resources, and anything as far as an example would be coming from a commercial publishing company um, in traditional textbook form. The next slide talks about the fact that open, there we go, what, what are these OER? What are the, um, how do we even find them? I guess we're gonna get into that, but what are we even looking for? So it can range from anything to a single item, which could be a formative assessment, a pre-assessment, um, an activity, a lesson plan, so that we build it out into a full unit of study so that we have, I taught second grade, um, so that I taught my geometry unit and we were looking at fractions. So I would have my, 
um, pre-assessment to see where everyone was towards the mastery of the standard. Then we would have whole groups, small groups, scaffolds for my ELLs, or for my special education students, additional resources for my gifted and talented kids whenever they were ready to move on. But I wanted them to kind of still focus on fractions and, and within that geometry unit, as well as a post-assessment so I could make sure that we had mastered that standard and we're ready to move on. So individual items to full items I could build out into a unit of study. And then we have things that are full programs. And these are starting to pop up a little bit more um, more often with some new nonprofits that are happening. Um, and so we have full textbooks that are openly licensed, things like OpenStax out of Rice University that started in higher education, have recently started to get into some K-12 work um, with their AP textbooks that they've created. We have other options like CK-12. Um, that um, we have uh, full textbooks, and then we also have full courses. And those are things that you would find technically in an LMS, and um, or even without an LMS, like a MOOC, um, that could be imported and exported into another learning management system. Um, so something like that would be from Canvas Commons, for example, where they are um, encouraging folks to be able to share their full course that others can be able to take it um, download, copy it, uh, revise and remix, and then customize it for their students. Other things around this, um, what OER um, is, it's accessible by anyone, print or digitally. Of course, there are benefits for keeping it digital because you can revise and, and update it more frequently. And then free and reuse rights. So we also have the, um, the thing around the, the five R's, which I will get into in just a moment. Okay, next slide. There we go. Open is not the same as free. So what is open? Talked about the five R's. I previewed that. So the next slide talks about those five R's. Open is free plus reuse, reuse, excuse me, reuse rights. Um, it is important to note that copyright does not, um, does not go away completely when we have something that's openly licensed. So um, Creative Commons actually started in the early 2000s as a nonprofit that sits alongside copyright. And so we're not eradicating copyright completely, but we wanted authors and creators to be able to give permission to people to be able to use their content without having to constantly ask for permission to do so. So those are the five R's that we're going to talk about now. What can you do with these resources? You can retain them. That means I can keep them in perpetuity. I don't have to worry about licensing every year. So I can retain them. I can reuse them. That means I can make an endless number of copies if I need to. I can revise them, meaning I can customize them for my students, but I can also customize them for a local context. This is also really important. Um, as I mentioned, whenever I first got started, in my kindergarten classroom, I translated a lot of my English curriculum into Spanish for my students did not realize that that was actually copyright infringement. Um, within the four walls of my classroom, and even some lawyers would say it was considered fair use because of the educational application. When I start to put things online and put them out there digitally, I have to be more cognizant of the license that's, a, that's attached to those. So if I'm revising something and I'm actually translating it, I have to be careful of the things that I'm translating. If it's openly licensed, I don't have to worry about that. And that's technically considered a revision. Remixing. Um, many of you may be familiar with app smashing, where you take one app and then you use that and then you put it into another app and you kind of create things. I always think of it in the terms of, of photos that you kind of edit and then you pull it into something else. You might make a video with it. And then there's a final product in the end. Remixing is where I'm simply going to pull in different multimedia to make whatever it is more engaging. And the last one is part is, is kind of key to all things open, and it's the redistribution. So I'm putting it back out there for the next person to be able to use. So I know that Kurt Bernhardt is in here, um, one of my former colleagues um, at the state level from Oklahoma, so that if I were creating something in Nebraska um, through the Department of Education and I put it out there for everyone else to be able to use, I'm redistributing that with an open license so that folks like Kurt in Oklahoma could then take that and share that with his districts and his, um, his teachers in the state of Oklahoma. So next, as I mentioned, Creative Commons was started in the early 2000s as a nonprofit. They've created a suite of six different licenses that you can actually attach to your created materials. You can also search for things on creativecommons.org, so I would encourage you to check them out if you are not familiar with them. Next. So here is where we start to get into what a traditional textbook adoption looks like. And this ranges. Again, I was just in California this past weekend, and I said, you know, typically it's every six, maybe seven or eight years that we start to go through a new textbook adoption. Um, maybe it's when new instructional standards are being adopted by the state. 
Um, some mentioned that they haven't had new textbooks in over 20 years. That is very unfortunate. And that is not, unfortunately, that is not an anomaly anymore. As we hear more and more stories coming out of different states with walkouts and things that are getting shared through social media with the textbooks or the actual curriculum that are in classrooms that are just kind of crumbling, um, we know that the textbook or the curriculum adoption is not necessarily happening in the same pattern that it has historically. But what I wanted to give you a preview of was something that um, does happen. And so if I focus on a proprietary ELA textbook series, um, just the hardcover textbook, if I look at a teacher edition, typically runs around $600. Um, the K-6 student edition, so just the textbook again, is around $80. And I'm not even going to get into the supplemental materials, like the consumables for spelling and grammar and writing and anything like that. So $600, $80. And then if I apply that to this um, school district, next slide, where we have eight sections, or excuse me, six sections, nope, six schools with three sections at each of those schools. Um, you can see the price breakdown that we'd be spending approximately $330,000 just for the physical hardcover textbooks, K6. Again, no bells and whistles, none of the ancillary or supplementary shiny objects, which are what make us really happy when we get new things, um, but about $330,000 that we would be spending just on English language arts. So then on the next slide, I've taken that same amount of money and thought through some of the other things that we could potentially repurpose that or reallocate that funding towards. And so the $330,000 from the very beginning of Go Open, it was encouraged that all of the districts compensate their teachers, putting together this team to, to really approach it from the district level. Um, so you have district leaders that are helping and believe in this and buy into this, as well as teachers that are being compensated for the work that they're doing. And so it's kind of bottom up, bottom and top and meeting in the middle. And we want to make sure that teachers are compensated for the work that they're doing. So teacher stipends, um, as well as substitute teachers, if they need to be coming out of the classroom, um, what, maybe it's once a month, maybe it's once a quarter, uh, maybe even just a, a once a a semester basis, but making sure the teachers are compensated. So again, some of that funding could be used for those things. We've also seen districts apply this towards their overall infrastructure. So that could go towards connectivity. Maybe you are supplementing what E-Rate has funded and you want to make sure that there's higher bandwidth that's actually coming into the classroom, as well as devices. So once we get the connectivity, do we have the devices that can actually connect to that? And then, of course, we have districts that are not one-to-one, -one, and that's okay. There's no requirement to be a one-to-one -one scenario to make this work. So we do have um, districts that are printing, and that is an option. And the last thing is additional learning resources. We are not throwing all of the things that we pay for out just because we want to go open. Um, in state some of that funding for all the things that I've already mentioned, but we can also pay for some higher quality learning resources that may require some sort of fee. So those could be databases or subscriptions, things like that, that we want to make sure can sit alongside um, the openly licensed resources. So, so it's just, it's interesting bringing this up because the other thing that um, districts mentioned is that they were putting resources into PD. And, and so supporting mm -hmm. the teachers and changing the whole pedagogy as, as, as another bullet point. Yes, absolutely. And there so. are, so I will say that there have been some states that have pushed back a little bit on this. I can tell you in certain states, you can actually apply for waivers to make this happen. Um, just oh. because of my experience working with some of these states that you can actually kind of reallocate the funding and repurpose that funding and even mm -hmm. get the state's approval to make that happen. Wow. Yeah, which is very cool. <laughs> so the benefits, of course, you can kind of see the cost benefits here, but then the benefits that we would um, talk to district leaders about are some of the following. So looking at equity of access. So I worked in um, Omaha Public Schools, which has 54,000 students, which is the largest school district in all of the state of Nebraska. Um, the entire state has 310,000 students. So you have to realize it's not like that everywhere. Um, and that may be considered a very small district in some of your opinions. Um, however, that was the largest district. So that was a very urban district. And I worked with some of our smallest districts across the state with about 75 students. And that was full K-12. 
And so I know that there, is, there are inequities in not only what the opportunities that these students have, but also in the materials that they have access to. So we really start to focus on things that are openly licensed so that we can make sure that there's equity of access and equity um, in, in opportunities as well. As I mentioned earlier, we can keep content relevant and timely. It's really important, especially with so many different things happening um, in current events these days, that we're giving access to things that are timely, that we're keeping students engaged. I know that the solar eclipse that happened in August um, will probably not be in a science textbook for a while. So how can we make sure that we're giving students access to relevant and timely materials? In all of my work with every single district, um, I have heard over and over and over again, um, as Mitch had mentioned, as far as the reallocation back into the professional development, this has been part of the benefits of all of this work. It is incredibly empowering as a teacher to be given the professionalism and kind of the professional, given back that professionalism um, as a teacher in being able to make those decisions about what's going to work for students, not just simply handed a textbook or a curriculum that the district purchases, um, purchases, but that I can actually look at my standards, unpack my standards, really understand what my students need to know by the end of the year, and then figure out how the resources are going to help me get there. And so kind of backwards designing that. And so it's incredibly empowering because of the collaboration that are that's happening between um, not only with within the teachers and, and internally within a district, but across districts and across state lines even. We've had some districts that have worked um, on a variety of like interstate and inter interdisciplinary projects. And that's really cool to see because that's not something that you would normally get to see um, if we stuck with our traditional instructional materials. And the last thing, of course, is that reallocation of funds. I've already mentioned this as far as some of the different ways that we've seen um, money be repurposed. And this, of course, is kind of the big hook for district leaders. They think, oh, we're going to save money. It's really about reinvesting that funding that we would have spent back into our district, especially the teachers. And this is huge. And we really, really encourage that as one of the benefits, of course. So now I'm gonna pause again because I've got two more questions for you. What instructional materials are you currently using in your schools? And I know that we kind of started to talk about this in the, um, in the chat box already. And then what's the process of getting instructional materials in your school? Do you even know what that process looks like? And are you part of that process? And so one, one of the ways we, we do this you know, is, or two of the ways of doing this is, first of all, in the textbook, text box, you know, people can volunteer there. But if somebody, uh, if somebody could raise their hand, click that raise hand button, mm -hmm. uh, we can bring them up. And, um, and that's actually really fun. Uh, you saw the fun that I had when I, um, when I was teasing <laughs> about Andrew. Uh, you can do the same thing. Um, you so, can do oh, that too. <laughs> right. So okay, good. We uh, let me um, let me open up a window and we we we. Um, oops, sorry. I um, I, I pressed the wrong button. No, I just pressed the but the mm -hmm. wrong button. And there there he is. Okay. Okay. So um, you know, and I'm going to bring myself down because we have a second person who's volunteering also. Great. Um, there's some user connection issues here, so I'm going to stop mine and I'm going to bring Ping up. Okay. Oops. Ah, I did that wrong. Also, one second. Let me. I'm okay. So um, yes, we have some. Okay, Dan. Hi, Dan. Hey, Christina. Hey, Christina. Nice to, nice see, to you see, you again. see you again. So nice to see you I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak more, more generally, generally about, about Minnesota. Minnesota. Um, um, I, work I work with, with a. a uh, uh, a small, a small nonprofit, nonprofit that provides, provides professional, professional development, development for, for schools, schools K through 20 to learn how to use OER, OER specifically with their, with their learning, learning management system. system. And I think, and I think it's, it's worth mentioning, mentioning that, to, to, in answer, answer to the question, question what, are what are we using in our schools? schools? In, Minnesota, in Minnesota, we've, we've actually created 40, 40 courses statewide. statewide. Uh, and there are 206 districts who have all participated in the creation of those courses. And I'm not trying to outdo your numbers, Christina, but we got 206 <laughs> districts just in, just no in Minnesota. Um, and those 40 courses are in English, math, social studies, and science, and grades three through 12. I tried to push them to go to kindergarten, but eh, you know, 
there was some pushback. Not all of the not all of, the, not all of those forty courses are totally released as OER yet. They're still going through the process of being reviewed by teams of teachers. And once they've been reviewed by teams of teachers, then they get released as OER. And as you can imagine, that's a, um, and we're not using any state funds to do this. This All of this work has been accomplished with a true grassroots level uh, by the districts themselves. So, so the downside, the downside to, that to that is that, is that it's, taking it's taking more time, time than some, some of us would kind of wish. <laughs> <it would laughs> <be>. but, but, <laughs> yes. Uh, because, because you, I mean, teachers, teachers just don't have time to do this, this but, but in the long, long run, run, I think I it's going to really pay, pay off. off. And um, there, there, are there are some, some courses, courses that are available, available for, I know third grade science is available, for instance. So, you, so you, any, any, anybody, anybody could go in and, and copy, copy that, that course. course. Now, they'd, now have, they'd to have to revise, revise it. it. If you're not in Minnesota, Minnesota you'd, have you'd have to revise it for the state, state standards. standards. And I know in, in Iowa, Iowa, that's, that's not, not a big, big deal. deal. In Nebraska, it would come, come very close. A few things that right. you could borrow from fourth or fifth grade to make that work. And there's a few other courses that are they're coming online all the time now as teachers get done with them. Okay, cool. So that's what we're doing. Thank you. That's great. Thanks so much for sharing that. Ping, would you like to share some of the yeah, your answer to the question? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. I, I'm just a Mandarin teacher. I'm teaching um, in uh, Goshen, New York. And then next year, I'm going to go full time teaching Warwick uh, School District. So I have okay. the right, the principal uh, the superintendent asked me, I can order whatever the, the textbook I want. Of course, textbooks is the best, but any textbooks are overdated because the information is changing, news is changing. Right. As a Mandarin teacher, like uh, what kind of other resources should uh, ask a school district uh, to order help me to uh, be the new, uh, update the newest information? I like the textbook because grammar, those kind of things. But the information sure, sure. is uh, about the textbooks is overdated. Changing. So yeah, how can yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah no, I completely understand. Um, so I've been working with some folks at the Copyright Clearance Center out of New York, and um, they are helping me with um, they're helping me with trying to secure um, materials that are written in other countries. Um, may not necessarily be openly licensed, but they're helping us secure the the copyright clearance to be able to use those. And so we're we've been focusing on French and Spanish to get started. I know Chinese is on their radar, so I want to. Um, follow up with you and and maybe have a conversation yeah, is there with any them. Any I can purchase at school or, or the, I, I don't mind purchasing myself. I just want to be updated. Yeah. My student yeah, use the information as possible. Yeah. Thank you for taking. Thank of you. Of course, of course. All right. So I'm going to move on. Um, we're I'm already looking at the time. It's like holy buckets. We're already running out of time. Okay. So we talked about um, we talked about the why. We have talked a little bit about. Um, I want to talk about um, how I've been able to curate some of these resources, give you just a few examples. Uh, and so if we skip right over into the next slide, um, how do I find these resources? So as I um, mentioned, I've worked on a website and have been curating my own list of resources. By no means is this exhaustive. Um, and this is just me digging in some of the resources that I would normally send people to, um, providing a brief description, a grade level and content area, as well as what type of resource you may find on this, um, this website or repository, and then some additional notes. So I try to really highlight things that are OER, um, but of course there are some places that have a combination of OER and free. And so it's really important, as we kind of mentioned earlier, as far as what free and what open um, are and kind of the distinguishing factors, um, it's really important to note that there may be a combination of the two. So a couple of examples that I wanted to point you to in particular, um, the first one would be uh, on our next slide, whenever I have a screenshot here of OER Commons. Um, oh, focusing on open educational resources. So the individual resources that would come first. Um, so I believe the next slide is of OER Commons. There we go. Um, so OER Commons is probably one of the largest repositories of openly licensed resources that exist. 
And they worked with the Office of Ed Tech in making sure that they were integrated um, with the Learning Registry, which um, is basically a card catalog of metadata um, that allows you to access things that are identified as openly licensed. So there are over 100,000 resources that are identified in this repository, as well as things that people or in educators have individually uploaded. And so there's a built-in rubric that you can actually check for quality as far as the standards alignment and quality of the resource. And then it's crowdsourced. So it's on a five-star rating system. So if you really like something, then you can give it a nice review um, with their uh, five-star rating system, as well as leave a review. And of course, that changes the algorithm as far as what will come up in the search. So OER Commons is my one of my go-tos as far as finding resources, individually resources, individual resources, excuse me. Um, then I mentioned courses. So I mentioned earlier Canvas Commons being one of these as well. Canvas is a learning management system. There is a free version of Canvas, but one of the things that they've been working on over the past couple of years is how can we share the courses that we create? And so they created the Canvas Commons in order to really kind of leverage that sharing community. And so I can go on there and put up a full course if, I have, if I've created it, and you can even go in there and download that and pull that into your own learning management system or you can pull out individual objects within that course um, to be able to use in your own courses. And then the last thing is the textbooks. So I mentioned um, we have openly licensed textbooks that are happening. I mentioned OpenStax already. CK12 being another one, um, nonprofit that's based out of California. They really invested in math and science to get started. And it starts in around 612 is where they, they do their focus. And they're increasing the amount of things that they offer in English language arts as well as social sciences. And then they are also going to be um, things like they are increasing the amount of simulations and interactives that they have on their dashboard, like in their actual system, which is really cool to see so that you can complement the Flexbook with additional resources and, and kind of interactives that are on there. All right, the next slide. And of course, the thing that helped us get started in this, in all of this work around fully open textbooks is Engage New York. So the state of New York started in 2012 with their Race to the Top funding, and they um, put an RFP out there for people to create a curriculum, pre-K-12 English language arts, as well as math that would be openly licensed. And so this is a full scoped and sequenced curriculum that you can go online and find um, through engagenewyork.org, I believe is the website. And you can implement these things individually so that you can supplement things you may have in your classroom. But you can also use the full curriculum. Next. So more of that is found on the website that I will make sure that you all have the link to. How are districts doing this? And there is, again, no definitive answer as far as how districts are doing this, but I wanted to give you a few examples. So next, next slide, you will see um, a Google Doc that Liberty Public Schools in Liberty, Missouri, just north of Kansas City, uh, they did for their biology course. They call this their Rainbow Road because they were able to take their science standards, um, shrink that down to about 50, and then shrink that down again to about 10 essential standards that they were going to work on for the entire year. And then they backwards planned it so that they would be able to put the resources in the Rainbow Road and um, kind of scope and sequence that out for the entire school year. So they put that in together through their themes, the individual units. This is all available online. It's openly licensed. The only thing that they do not give access to is the common assessment because then students would have access to the assessments. <laughs> Uh, next, we have Broken Arrow Public Schools. Broken Arrow, I know that Kurt mentioned this in the chat box as well. Broken Arrow, um, they started with a CK-12 Flexbook in their science and then kind of expanded from them. They've scaled in other, um, in other grade levels for science as well as in different content areas. And so theirs are done. Um, you can access them through their Google Drive links that they share out on Broken Arrow's website. So that is Google. Um, how Liberty and Broken Arrow have done that. Low barrier of entry because they're Google schools and a lot of teachers were already familiar with the way that they were doing that. The next slide shows you how the Illinois State Board of Education and a particular district within Illinois have been able to kind of scope and sequence their work. And they're using something as simple as Live Binders. And if you're not familiar with Live Binders, an oldie but a goodie, is a great curation tool that allows you to figure out, again, the scope and sequence of things, and then you drop in resources that will help you get there. So Live Binders is a perfect example, again, low barrier of entry, because a lot of folks are already used to be using this tool. 
Then the next slide shows you Puyallup School District in Washington State. They built out all their civics curriculum, which is a middle school, I believe it's eighth grade civics curriculum. Um, and they did everything through OneNote. They're a Microsoft district. And so they built everything out in OneNote and then have that shared among their district as well as um, openly licensed so that you all have access to this as well. So the next slide has two more questions. I'm actually going to skip this because we're running low on time. Sorry for the lack of interactivity because I really want to get to the question that always comes up around quality. So how do we make sure that these materials are high quality? Whenever I start to have this conversation, I want to make sure that we parse out two things. We talk about quality, we often lump these two together and that is standards aligned and high quality. And I think these are two separate conversations because I can have a standards aligned worksheet but it's still a worksheet. And it's not necessarily the best thing to put in my students' hands. So we need to make sure that we're having those conversations and make sure that we're talking standards aligned as well as high quality. A couple of things that have come up recently, um, non, the nonprofit Ed Reports. If you are not familiar with edreports.org, I would highly encourage you to check out their work. They're taking largely in math and, and ELA right now. They're starting to get into science. They um, are working with teacher reviewers that are actually in the classroom and, and understand how to review um, instructional materials and curriculum. And they go through this series of reviews. And so they take um, a variety of series, whether they're a digital or print or a combination of the two, and they review the different series. Their top two rated series right now in math are Illustrative Mathematics, which comes from Open Up Resources, which is 6-8 Math. It happens to be openly licensed, and that's our, their highest rated math right now. And then their highest rated English language arts is EL Education, which is K-5 ELA from Open Up Resources, which happens to be openly licensed. This bodes well for open educational resources, that this came back with such high, um, high reviews um, for rigor, for standards alignment, for interactivity. Um, you can see how they've been able to review it and they're very transparent in their review process. So this is a helpful tool if you're not familiar with it, I highly recommend it. In addition, the state of Louisiana um, have gone together and created kind of this statewide team where they looked at the most um, used resources in the state. They're a very local control state where each parish and district gets to determine what curriculum or what instructional materials they're using. And so they put together this team to look at the most commonly used resources. And they looked at this um, through a rubric system where they put tier one exemplifying quality, tier two approaching quality, and tier three not representing quality. They looked at traditional resources as well as benchmark assessments and even some interventions. And so this is really a great resource to look at. I will tell you everything that I taught from tier three down at the bottom, um, not representing quality. So this is really great to look, um, just kind of see where your current instructional materials may even be on their scale. Then the next thing is one of the Go Open districts, um, Grossmont Union High School District in San Diego County, um, they took the Achieve rubric by Equip and they actually customized it for Grossmont Union High School District. They wanted to look at specific types of resources, whether that would be their core content that would kind of serve as their foundation, any sort of supplemental resources, and then they have some additional teacher materials that they would look at. And they simplified the rubric so that they're looking for a 321 and that everyone on their team would all identify if this would be a quality resource. Um, they all agreed as far as what the parameters would be for a quality resource. They openly licensed this rubric for to use. And I think it's a really great kind of entry point for people to be able to have the conversation around quality. So next slide. There we go. So I'm going to um, kind of combine the, the last two questions that we skipped and also these two questions. So the last two were, um, how, does the, how does this support the work that you're already doing if you're already looking at some of these open educational resources or do you already use some of these? And then the conversation around quality. How do you talk about quality materials at your school um, or are you involved with the decisions about instructional materials? And these are going to be our final questions that we have time for tonight. So I would love well, to encourage you. Yeah. And there was there was a related question from uh, Terry yeah. Polite. Okay. That okay. OER also links to items you need a membership to see, where you need a membership to see the full resource like NCTM. So is there a way to search for Ooh, items okay. that are available for all? 
Oh, that's a great question. So we've had conversations with NCTE and NCTM. Um, they were not interested in necessarily openly licensing their content. They wanted to make it available for free, but it still requires you to sign up for an account in order to access those things. Mm -hmm. So that's what I know of. Um, I don't know if there are any other options at this point. Okay. And uh, so you, you, you know, you just asked four questions and then I'd like to encourage people if you, um, if you'd like to talk about, you know, any of the four questions about how you find quality materials or, you know, how you're involved with uh, decisions and instructional materials, uh, click on that raise hand uh, icon and, uh, I, and we can bring you up, up on stage. I know that, um, again, in the interviews that, that I was doing at, at districts, uh, a lot of districts are moving to um, a model where people at the district level um, may choose 10 or 12 possible resources to be used as the main content for a, for a grade. Mm -hmm. And then they assemble a team of teachers and those teachers don't necessarily, those teachers are not told anything about costs. And so they're evaluating okay. the materials just on the basis of how good they are. Once they choose okay. the top, the top two or three resources, then they have someone come in and describe the resources to them, you know, make a presentation. And then after the presentation, they then decide which is their absolute top. And then the district goes back. Mm -hmm. And if it's if it's for purchase, the district goes and, and negotiates with the publisher. If it's free, then they go about, you know, determining how they make that available to, to all their people. But it's kind of interesting that the people involved with the, the quality um, uh, criteria, you know, are not looking at the cost. They're looking at what is the best for our students, and then the district figures out how to how to bring those resources in. And very often, because the OER resources are more geared to, uh, you know, it, it are more geared to um, experiential learning. Um, sure. They're finding in in many cases that it's the OER resources that that actually win. That's really interesting. And it, it varies with every school district because, yep. um, I mean, everyone approaches this so differently and, and working with rural schools, I would say that they have to leverage the service units or the service agencies that sit between the state department as well as like the local mm -hmm. level because right. of such small numbers. And so they, they try to leverage kind of that co-op or that consortium model where, um, you know, you may have one person that teaches all of 612 English language arts. And so they all have to get together. They review what's available for, um, for the new textbook series or the new instructional materials. They all kind of decide as a team um, and then they'll leverage the numbers from this district with this district and this district. And that's how they'll get the instructional materials at yep. a reasonable cost for some of our mm -hmm. smaller districts. Um, so right. it's, yep. that's interesting to hear that they like not hide the price, but kind of, but they kind of hide they the do. price. They, they, kinda, they yeah. hide the price away from the decision. You know, then the district, you know, the district will negotiate the, you know, at that, you know, it's, it, you know, we'll talk about the price, and then if the price becomes too high, may, they may end up with this with the second resource. With, but with um, second, yeah. but in any case, they will make every effort to accommodate what the best resource is for the kids. Right. Which is, you know, you know that's what we want for the kids, right? We want the best resources. Yeah, in there. yeah. Absolutely. Um, Detroit Public Schools just announced, uh, I believe it was last month, where they had also pulled together a team from across the district um, based on like some failing grades and, and some specific content areas. They looked at ELA and math, and then they put forth a recommendation of three different options for, and it's building it's a building specific decision. So mm -hmm. they put forth the three recommendations for English language arts and for math. And then the building level gets to decide what they end up doing. Oh, and mm -hmm. each of those had OER as one of the options, which was really exciting to see. Right. And Dan McGuire brings up a great point in the, you know, he, uh, he typed this into the question is that the blind, you know, one of the things with a blind evaluation becomes, um, I'm going to change his words a little bit, but it becomes even better if the, uh, school or the teachers have the ability to modify um, it, it, if the ability to modify is included into the criteria. Oops. And ah, you're um, darn. 
Uh, let me, I'm going to bring you down and bring you back up because you, we just lost your video feed. And uh, let me see if I can, if I can find you. Otherwise, we are at the end of the hour. So we could, um, we, we could stop. And, and I have Christina's information here, but it looks like um, Christina may have dropped off, unfortunately. Um, so given the, the fact that we're at the end of the hour and it looks like Christina, unfortunately, oh, there she is again. Okay. So let me, let me bring you back up there. Um, so yes. Oops. Oh, well, you're back. I'm so welcome sorry. back. <laughs> no, I don't know what happened, but anyhow, well, well welcome back. So, um, <laughs> So, so those, you know, those are the questions from people. And um, do you have you know, like your closing, a closing thought? Um, I think my thing, my, my biggest thing is that I call me an optimist through and through, but I used to share my resources with my colleagues across the hall um, and in my building. And I feel like when we get more people that share their resources and kind of contribute to the commons as a whole, um, then we're all going to be better off because of it. Uh, and so I'm a, I will end with my Care Bears, which is I'm a child of the 80s and I love the Care Bears and I believe that caring is sharing and sharing is caring. And I will do a Care Bear stand in that honor. Um, so I please join the community because we need more people um, to contribute what they're doing so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Well, thank you. And, and I think that that's making a, you know, is already making an impact in education and um, it, it will, that impact will continue to grow as more and more people uh, produce and share op open resources. So uh, yeah. thank you for the work that you do and the impact that thank you're you. having. Thank you, I appreciate and, that. And thank you for appearing on EdChat Interactive and uh, yeah. sharing, we're gonna make an archive. Um, and you said that, that you're willing to share the slides. So what we'll do is, um, if, if it's okay with you, I mean, we'll take these slides, we'll put them on our website so people will be able to just click and download them and we'll let that everybody know when, when they're up. Okay. All right. That so, um, well, well, uh, good night. Thank you again, Christina. Thank you. And, all. Uh, and, and thank you all. And this is you know, Mitch Weisberg and, and I'll saying good night for chat interactive and hope to see you all next week and at future events. Uh, take care.